And I'm trying to, while you were saying that, I was trying to find my notes for this next and final program that we're going to talk about this week. The AEW, all, is were they all in or all out? All out of options? All out of jobs? It was all, all out of ideas? A variety so, of all outs. All out, again on September 3rd, in the Chicago United Center that they were just in the previous night. This time, they had about 10,000 people in the place because it was a pay-per-view, and the tickets went on sale months ago. And when with AEW running the Chicago United Center, one would imagine that everybody that bought a ticket, whether they bought it for him or not, pretty much assumed they were going to be seeing CM Punk. Would you think that's not the case, Brian? I would think anyone who bought a ticket within the last two months minus the last week thought that CM Punk was going to be there and more than likely in one of the featured matches. Yes, and then they find out the day before that he's not going to be, and there was a smaller crowd for Saturday night for collision. They weren't happy. And then they have 10,000 people come and see, so you heard what they did before the pay-per-view when everybody was coming in, right? With the shirts. I've seen several reports of this and it seems so ridiculous that I almost like, I want visual confirmation. It just seems preposterous in Chicago with all of this happening, that they'd be confiscating shirts or signs. Well, they, they, weren't, they weren't able to take people's shirts away. They were confiscating the signs. But if you came with a CM Punk sign, they would take it away. And if you came wearing a CM Punk t-shirt, they would make you turn it inside out or deny you entry to the building. And think about this. On that whole pay-per-view in Chicago, in the United Center, and this is the hottest topic, not only in the company, but in wrestling, did you see a CM Punk t-shirt? I thought I did. I actually thought I saw a few. That's why I was surprised when I saw these reports come out. I didn't, you didn't see any CM Punk signs, did you? Except for the one guy in the front row that said, Tony Khan cured cancer. They made sure to leave that one. No, there was another sign I saw. I don't know if it was Collision. I thought it was the pay-per-view. It said, cry me a river. And then someone, it almost looked like they wrote in after the fact, CM Punk. Maybe because they couldn't get the sign in if it said CM Punk. But I don't know. I mean, that's that's it. He's their biggest no merch mover. Signs. He's their biggest merch mover, I believe, up until, you know, they fired him. I'm guessing they can't sell his merch anymore. But, you know, WWF got killed in the Observer by those readers years ago for when they would make people who showed up in a four horseman shirt. Like you had to switch that shirt. You could not sit within camera view in a Crockett promotion shirt. And that's what Tony Khan's doing now. Well, except, I'm sure except now they're his own done. shirts. That's the funniest yeah. part. Well, now it's going to be in the in the Observer. It's going to be oh, he was just trying to keep the peace amongst the locker room by letting not letting the fans stir stuff up or some shit. But anyway, so they thought they might be safe. The first match on the pay per view: MJF and Adam Cole against the Dork Order, Little Brutus and Long John Silver, and Pizzeria Uno was in the corner also in his ridiculous clown outfit. So. Now it's Chicago, it's the United Center, is the, the scene of one of their greatest triumphs before, and the people have bought tickets for a pay-per-view. They don't get to see Punk at all, and MJF, the other biggest, hottest guy in the company, is in the opening match in a joke tag team match just for storyline that they could have done on television. I'm telling you, they killed the city of Chicago. So anyway, Kevin Kelly said over 10,000 fans have filled the United Center. He should have said a half filled. It seats 20,000. You shouldn't say fill. You should say over 10,000 fans have converged on the United Center. It sounds good, but it's still not a lion. Anyway, the, this was, they did the comedy at first. And the, MJF had the crowd in the palm of his hand, milking the comedy stuff. And, uh, you know, that's great. He doesn't have to take any bumps. But then he sells his neck on a tackle and rolls out. And it's like supposedly he's got a stinger or the bad neck from Wembley. And then the heel hits him with a chair in the back of the neck. And everything stops. And the doctor's checking. And nothing is happening. And the referee's not counting. 
And I see what they were trying to do. They were trying to instill some kind of mystery in the finish. Will the dork order beat these guys? Because, you know, MJF's taken out of the match or whatever. But no, you shouldn't be doing an angle with the hottest star in the company and job guys. Or with Adam Cole with two of the hottest stars in the company and job guys. Nobody bought it. Nobody cared because they knew Either he's going to come back or Adam's going to do something's going to, it's all going to turn out all right. The dork order is not suddenly going to kill Adam Cole and MJF. And then they had to get five minutes of heat on Cole two on one where the people had died down before finally MJF comes back out with the referees on his tail and everything and the people woke up. And then Adam Cole gets the tag and the crowd explodes, but the crowd would have exploded if he'd got the tag to MJF, if MJF had been in the corner the whole time. Because it's the dork order. They just want to see MJF do the fucking kangaroo kick and the double clothesline. And that's what they did. And they won one, two, three. But it, do you see what I'm saying is that why go to that much trouble for this insignificant preliminary match. Your thoughts. I paid attention to it because of the MJF angle or, you know, tease during the match of the neck injury. But other than that, no, look, it's the dark order. They both look like they should be working at dairy barn. I'm not interested in watching them. I just Do you want still to have dairy barn uh, on Long Island. I'm still dairy barn. Son of a bitch. Not many left though, but it was a wonderful convenience just to be able to pull right up and, Hey, can I get a gallon of 1%? Can I get some eggs? Can I get some Cheetos? Get the fuck out of there. Pull right up to a barn and get your dairy. Well, as I was saying, I didn't give a shit about this match. Uh, I just wanted to see what was going to happen with MJF and Cole, and if Roddy Strong would show up or anything, so... And and nobody did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Nothing. so, you know, just... I guess it's a central theme. I don't necessarily think matches are just good if they just have lots and lots of kickouts. <laughs> like, I don't see that as skill. Not that it's not a skill to constantly do that physically, but there's a lot of things that people rave about just because people kick out nonstop of everything. And again, it doesn't necessarily even apply to this match in that sense, but that's all the Dark Order could do. You know they're not going to win, so it's just about them getting near falls. But no, no. Why, why are these guys still there? Uno! Why the fuck did anybody ever give him a job, much less he keep it? I, I mean, we know that's a rhetorical question. He's friends with the buckaroos. But seriously, there's serious people in the business that deserve a break. They've never been seen before. And this fucking guy, just dreck, just the state of him. Anyway. Well, he's got the right friends, but anyway. So... MJF and Cole are leaving the ring and Samoa Joe's entrance starts. Of course, it always happens that music starts playing before the previous match gets out of the way yet. But you'll never guess, but Joe and MJF had a, a little set to where Joe shoved him out of the way and got in the ring and then MJF hit the ring and jumped on Joe. Joe front face locked him. Security came in, pulled him apart. Joe was taunting MJF, so now we've we've got a glimpse in something that's going to take the place of Punk's rivalry with Samoa Joe and that maybe, it, hopefully, it'll be MJF. That could be interesting. MJF needs a fresh opponent. Yes. And there aren't too many there because he's kind of exhausted the matches we want to see with him against a Moxley or a Jericho or various other people. Again, I always fear the Orange Cassidy match coming. But him and Joe is intriguing. That was the highlight of the whole opening match for me, was just that moment. As soon as Joe's music hit, you said, oh, no, they're not going to. <laughs> and then they tease it. And MJF going to the ring and firing up against Joe may be the best moment he's had as a traditional babyface. Yeah, because the people were just... He wasn't... He didn't go in there and poke him in the eye and do his heel stuff. He went in there and started fighting him. And the people, oh, he's got a gumption. I want to see that. I want to see that. You know, I said the other day I wanted to see MJF versus Roddy Strong one time to see what that's like. But MJF and Joe, if it's not just a one, if it's a one-off match, it's intriguing. If it's more than that, it's really intriguing. Babyface MJF versus a 
heal Samoa Joe. And they could talk. That. Yeah. Oh, they could talk. But Joe didn't, he let his actions do his talking for him up against Shane Taylor for the Ring of Honor World TV title. And obviously, this was to get Joe on the card and give him a win. Nothing against Shane Taylor, but as we, may, we never even heard of him until last week they announced the match and played a couple of highlights. And he's a bigger guy, so this was a big man fight. They were chopping hard, punching hard. Uh, there wasn't a lot of response because the crowd did not know Shane Taylor. But it was hard and it was snug and it was serious. And I would say if I was critiquing Shane Taylor, he needs to watch the obvious slaps on his strikes and the boxing shorts are not flattering. And then after they had a nice little meat slapper, uh, Joe got the coquina clutch and got the tap out. And that was what that was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't All answer right. my, The first time I've seen Shane Taylor, didn't do anything wrong. It was fine for what it was. Do you, do you see the shorts are a little off-putting? Yeah, well, they're very baggy. They're very, very baggy. Very baggy, yeah. And seem to be needed to be pulled up a lot. All right. Speaking of baggy, uh, Darby Allen came to the ring with his baggage, Nick Wayne, now that he's adopted him, apparently. For the TNT title match with Dino Douche with Christian Cage in the corner. And they brought Jim Ross in for commentary on this one and, and a couple more. They were trading out the announcers. And here we go with Darby. And everybody thinks I'm going to eviscerate this because the fucking goofy lizard is in it. This is the best that I've seen him, I think. Now, the problem is still the booking and the way this was put together. But the big fucker as awkward as he is when he's got a little guy to throw around, he looks impressive. But the, the, the match, Darby jumps on him, has a big flurry, they go to the floor within 30 seconds, and they stay there. And Dino takes over, the corpse referee was involved, so he was useless. And the match is not, the bell is not rung yet. So, Dino runs Darby into the stairs and he's busted open and he's bleeding and he turns the, the metal stairs over on top of him and walks up the stairs to get back in the ring. Well, by the time this all happens, they've been on the floor for three minutes and they've done a great angle. It was a nice angle for a match. Their Darby was attacked. He's busted open and bleeding and banged into the stairs, the stairs turned over on top of him, a 300-pound man walking on top of the stairs. That's a great angle. They should come back and book a match out of that for when Darby recovers. But instead, they've already done the angle for the match, they've already got the match, that's the way they started it, and now they have to have a match. And Darby sells great, but part of it is they're really hurting him. But I understand the psychology of, again, of putting the small, vulnerable baby face in jeopardy and then showing how plucky he is in the fight against the bigger guy. But not when you destroy the guy at the start and then start the match and start the fight against the bigger guy. Then it's just ridiculous. Is it not? Eh, I mean... There's so much ridiculous to go around on this show. And you know, they have a good match after that, after he's already killed his opponent and he should never walk again. But and, that's a and, that has to be a Darby thing because we've seen that before, haven't we, in his yeah, matches? Uh, yes, constantly. So anyway, um, Christian tried to give uh, Nick Wayne the towel to throw in, but Darby hit Christian with a dive. And... You know, the people were into it. They liked Darby. When they went into false finishes, it's just that I know, like I said, he sells well, and part of it is they're really hurting him. And hes it's not a joke. It's not something to be, you know, laughing about, but his career is not going to last long because he's going to hurt himself bad because he obviously doesn't care. He said he doesn't care. But then the finish is... 
Christian hits Nick Wayne with a chair and distracts Darby by like he's going to concerto Nick Wayne. So then Dino catches Darby and gives him two tombstones in a row and a clothesline to beat him. One, two, three, the 300-pound man. Two tombstones and a clothesline after a 15-minute match, after the guy was left laying in a puddle of his own blood before the match started. One, two, three. And then they were going to give him the concerto, but all the job guys ran in to stop him. It just, you're going to have to fire this kid out of a cannon in six months to get anybody to pop, because what else are you going to do to him? Man, it's, it's infringing on his good-natured absorption of all this punishment that he feels like he has to take. But I would, again, if there was some structure in the company, you could use that drive determination and talent he has for not killing himself every single time he does this shit and control it and use it when it meant the most. And you could get the most out of it. But I digress. Moving along? Moving along. I agree with you. You know, I like it when you just agree with me and don't interrupt me. I hate your singing. All right. I knew it couldn't all be positive. Miro versus Hobbs. It was another big man fight uh, in the vein of Samoa Joe and Shane Taylor, but both these guys honestly look better and are physically and are more mobile than Taylor was. Plus, and, the, plus the crowd helped make this. Well, plus the crowd knows who they are. And Miro has more experience. So, nevertheless, punches, kicks, and clotheslines were the order of the day. And they just, they had a slobber knocker. And it was serious, and it was stiff. And they worked hard, and the people were with it. As I recall, Hobbs is the heel, and Miro's the babyface, but you can't tell either by the match they had or their appearance, but they just fought each other. And Hobbs took another great bump over the top rope, different kind of way than he did on television. But there were, there were great pops for the big spine busters and the big power moves, and people got into it. And I must admit, it was much better than I was afraid it was going to be with two big smash mouth guys. It might be awkward or clumsy or whatever, but this was a good fight that the people liked. And I swear to God, they almost had it. And then Hobbs goes for the camel clutch, which Miro calls the Redeemer. He was going to give, his, give him his own finish, but Miro slipped out of it and got his own. And he had cranked back once, and then Hobbs is still green. And so I don't fault him, but it was just unfortunate. When Miro cranked up the first time, he's got it, and you saw Hobbs' hand go up, he was going to tap. But Miro didn't want him to tap so quick. He wanted to keep it on the big man for a minute, so you see him put Hobbs' hand back down like not now. And then he had it for a second, and as Miro goes to adjust his grip to really do the crank back, Hobbs put his hand up there and tapped again, so he tapped on the guy when he was adjusting the hold. And it was, I was like, oh, man. You know, Hobbs is going to be great. This is the best he's had a chance to be. I think in terms of the longest match with, you know, motivation and uh, an angle behind it. But he, he's, he's still a little green, and he didn't, there was a mistiming there. And I don't even know if you saw that, but that's the first thing I saw. What was the first thing you saw? There was well, not the first thing. It was the last thing because it was the finish. But the first thing I saw about the finish was it was obvious to me that Hobbs was trying to tap too quick and tapped on Miro when he was adjusting the hold, not even when he was cranking it. Yeah, that kind of flattened me. I thought it was a good match, though. And again, the crowd, although I wouldn't be sitting there chanting "meat" or whatever the fuck, they were going slap meat or chop meat or beat meat or. Something of that yeah, nature. It's one of those things where you can't tell if they're even reacting to the specific wrestlers or the match more just like they've decided this is their thing. <laughs> they're going to cheer meat tonight. But good. I'm happy they didn't have QT out there with Hobbs. 
That's a big positive. Aha, that was a plus. I didn't miss him in more ways than one. And then Lana coming out, or, or CJ, with her own Titantron. Well, I was going to get to that in a second. Oh, okay, go ahead. Well, it was just after the, the match. That's what we were commenting on. The They had it all the way till then. And then they shook hands. And I'm thinking, well, what the... F and then Miro goes to leave and Hobbs jumps him from behind. So now we know who the heel is. He's getting some heat. But then he gets on Miro and he was punching the ground beside Miro's head. Did you see that? That hurt my I feelings. I did. I saw. It was not good. And he need as big, as impressive as he is and as he looks, he's got to do... If he can't throw a punch, don't get down on the guy and throw him. Level the fucking guy and then drop an elbow or pick him up and slam him or put him over the ropes and choke him with a maniacal look. But don't throw phony punches if you're a 300-pound guy and you hit like a girl or don't hit at all. But anyway, that's when music played and on the screen popped up the words hot and flexible. And I know Miro in the promos has talked about his goddamn double-jointed wife. But she's not ever appeared on this program. This was a surprise. She's running in to save her husband from something that, if this was a shoot, she wouldn't have known was going to happen. But she took time to have her goddamn hot and flexible graphic queued up on the Titantron and music, and when she came out, she posed for the people while her husband was getting assassinated. And then she charges to the ring and gets a chair and slides in the ring, and I'm thinking, oh my God, certainly to God, he's not going to sell this. And he didn't. She hits Hobbs with the chair across the back, and he stands up and turns around and snatches the chair away from her. And then they, he stares at her, and she's kind of backing up, but really they're, they're not really moving. And he stares at her for so fucking long, it gets phony. And then Miro picks up the chair and hits him in the back. He should have snatched her. He doesn't have to hit her, but he should have snatched her. Can you imagine the ooh? When that fucking 300-pound giant muscle-bound monster snatches that goddamn 120-pound little five-foot-tall girl by the hair and just draws back, everybody, ah, oh, and then he gets hit by the chair. But standing there, it just made him look stupid. Because, I'm sorry, if a woman hits me with a chair, I'm, I'm punching her in the fucking face. Sorry. I'll apologize now. But anyway, then Miro hit the hit him with the chair over the head and Powerhouse bailed out. And then Miro, everybody's cheering, thinking they're going to hug. And Miro looks at his wife and gets mad at her and leaves. So now he's mad at her. He, he's not mad at God anymore. He's mad at his wife for saving his ass when he was getting his ass kicked. And his wife, by the way, doesn't have a name yet because the other one was trademarked. So, good match. And then what the fuck is this angle? Is this going to be more of this weird psychological shit where he's mad at his wife because she's double-jointed and saved him and made him sad? I don't know what the fuck. What would this be about? Oh, I don't know, and I don't think anyone else does. I just want to see Miro kick ass and have kick ass matches, but he keeps going back to this fight with God and dark rooms and light rooms that he's broadcasting his promos from, and now hot and flexible. A surprise run in, a surprise run in to save her husband after shaking the hand of Powerhouse Hobbs. Hobbs surprisingly turned on him. Little did he know that Lana was prepared with Titantron. She comes out there, she has music, she has a screen. <laughs> She's wearing an outfit. If I was going to go save someone in a fight, that's not the outfit I'd be wearing. I wouldn't have done the thing where Hobbs went to hit her. I think that's a step too far in 2023. You get in trouble. Well, then don't do it at all. Don't have a 120-pound woman I hit a fucking 300-pound guy with a chair if you don't want the 300-pound guy to do what he would naturally really do if it really happened. I think it's one thing if Hobbs had a woman in his corner who, as soon as Lana came in the room with the chair, they can go at it. But I agree with you on that. 
she shouldn't have done that. And then again, we're teasing now the Miro Lana feud. Can't wait to see that match. Clearly, she's afraid of nothing. She ran in there to tap and screaming house. like, "You turn around, you son of a bitch! I'm gonna, you're gonna do nothing and like it, Missy." It's interesting though. The fans there knew who she was. You know, the fans there knew who she was off being on WWE TV a few years ago. I don't know if the yes. roles were reversed. If a if a WWE fan would recognize someone from AEW that had been in a similar position, I, I would bet money that you're correct about that as well. Next up was Ruby Soso and our girl, Chris Statlander. And as much as I like Statlander, she's got the size, better look now. She's serious. Her work is improving. On the other hand, Ruby does a lot of awkward, odd things. And we were running late. So Soraya drew the referee and Ruby got the paint can, but Tony Storm came out from under the ring and once she found Ruby, she took the paint can from her, and Ruby turned around into a tombstone one, two, three. See, the tombstone still works on the girls. You don't have to give them two and then hit them with a clothesline. Yes, you do. It depends on who you're up against. Ruby's not the opponent for that. Well, although Ruby is the same size as Darby Allen, same body weight at least, so... Ruby's not, um... Statlander's good and getting better. I'll just say that. Yes, let's say that. All right, you're wondering, was there anything worth our attention on this program? And the answer is yes, and it came up next. The strap match between Ricky Starks and Brian Danielson. And I've got to admit that I was, you know, zoned out on a lot of this stuff, and I wasn't really looking forward to Punk being replaced in this issue or anything about any of this. But they worked their ass off here. and. You know, it, Starks, as we said in the collision talk, was is motivated. He He's going to goddamn get over, it, no matter what he has to do, it, it, no matter how many of these things gets jerked out from under him, but Danielson coming back. And yes, we mentioned that a strap match may be easier with a bad arm than a regular style Danielson match, but he can do all of these. That's why he's been hidden for so long in that goofy group with that stupid, bald, fucking garbage wrestler, Moxley, and that fucking ridiculous whole gimmick where you saw less of Danielson than you did of everybody else, and he's the one that you wanted to see, that it's nice to see him. Again, he's had a couple of runs where he was at one point, he was the best heel in the company. One point, he was the best baby face. If he's got something to do, he can do it. He just, uh, Danielson has no, I'm going to put my foot down and not associate or be associated with this stupid booking or this crummy group or this nonsensical whatever. And he, he excels at periods of time and then gets shoved into something that he won't say no to. Nevertheless, I like this best of anything. And from the Ricky Starks jumping Danielson at the start, before Aubrey Ed could hook the reins up to him. Um, and he attacked Danielson before the bell and whipped him with the weight belt and busted him open with a punch with the buckle. And Danielson got good color. And then when they got in the ring, started the match. And again, this pre-match attack worked. So Darby and Dino didn't have done, shouldn't have done the one they did. Because this worked, and it's a gimmick match, and it's two main event guys, and there's an issue of some description. So anyway, Danielson sells great, fights back great, and then when he takes over, he whipped the shit out of Starks. People were into this. There was and Then Starks was bleeding, and Danielson was whipping him more. They kept it moving. There was hard contact. The blood seemed called for in this, not fake or goofy or like within two minutes when Moxley does it for no reason or, you know, the typical garbage indie shit. This was an extension of what they were doing, I thought. And then, you know, they did, did a big one-two yay boo with the strap whips and Danielson bowed up and just kicked the shit out of Starks. And then... When Big Bill tried to interfere, Steamboat was up off of color, 
and grabbed Bill and punched him and chopped him. And then Danielson wiped him out with a dive. And then they did a couple of big false finishes. And then finally, Danielson hit the stomps and got the label lock. And Starks was able to break it once. So Danielson wrapped the strap around his neck and basically choked Starks out. Starks made a great face. He didn't tap. He passed out. And again, I always say about these immobile finishes, just when it's some cold match with some goof that wants to be in his fantasies, an MMA star or a badass, and you're immobile in the ring for a minute and then somebody just taps, that's bullshit. It's not exciting. But when they did, they built this up from the label lock crossface to then wrapping the strap around his neck and choking him literally until near death, almost to David Carradine levels of chokingness. That I'll buy if they're in the same place because something was going on. So this was... To me, this was the best thing on the show, and it wasn't even really close with the other stuff. What'd you think? I thought Takeshita versus Omega was better. What? Um, yeah, I think this ma- you know, I know everyone's raving about this match. This match didn't do it for me. Just having eh. arbitrary violence. There is no feud. Danielson hasn't been there. He's had no program with Ricky Starks. Their first interaction was the night before, where the heel came back to save the babyface Ricky Steamboat. And in general, I'm not a strap match fan, to be fair. But just watching these guys stand there while the other one whips the other one. And then just, I don't know, just watching Ricky Stark's face while he submits. It seems like that's the thing people like, the brutality and then feigning that he could almost die. But I don't know. Everyone loved it. I'm the only one. I'm the only one. I'm telling you I liked it because there was some legitimate violence here or legitimate looking violence, which is so rare these days, especially from this bunch. And... And just the, they didn't fuck up a stipulation for once. They didn't fuck the whole thing up. They didn't make it clown showy. Um, they tried to do it seriously. So I gave them points for that. Yeah, I'm not saying it was bad or anything, but there were people raving about it like it's the greatest strap match of all time. And I don't think it's. Yeah, I don't. I and I don't think it's that. that. But I also, you know, again, I, I, I don't know. I haven't been into Danielson that much in a while. I like a few matches. Well, here there's there. been no reason to. I'm talking about when he wrestled. Yeah. But this match, I'm the only one, though. I'm the only one. Everyone else loved it. Well, at least you admit it. Yeah. So you you recognize your shortcomings. You're going to do something about them. No, I'd rather just be able to stand over here in the corner, point at everyone, and say, it's all you, not me. Well, that's another way of looking at it. So speaking of another way of looking at things, Claudio and Useless versus Kingston and Shibata. We could look at it or we couldn't. I determined, again, I'm running fucking late. And I briefly saw Claudio doing the phony BBC elbows like the rest of them, so I assume now they've ruined his work also. I knew there was going to be some comedy material in here, but I, I can't. out of nowhere, Claudio hit Kingston with a European uppercut, one, two, three. And the people kind of farted. Did, were they farting at the rest of the match, or did you notice? Well, let me just say, I never know what to say about this, because whenever I think the crowd is dead, people tell me that the crowd is fully engaged. I guess it's like some mixture of a 1970s Japanese wrestling crowd with a call and response crowd from a from a church. I really don't know what it's <laughs> supposed to be. I saw people said this match was really good. Uh, I even saw Dave Meltzer said like another excellent oh. match or whatever it was. Well, of course he did. And I'm watching it like, man, I don't see it at all. And that's where there's just a complete disconnect with a certain fan base and people like me. And there's a lot of people like me out there, as we know. Nobody's like you. You're one of a kind, Brian. Well, the next contest that came up on the AEW All Out pay-per-view extravaganza was one that you just claimed that you liked better than this strap match. And I've got to admit... It was not as bad as I was feared it might be because Harpo kept himself under control and didn't do a lot of the really egregiously phony or silly or stupid shit that he's known for. He's even got his faces somewhat under control. You know, because they used to make that face that reminded us of when his butt plug would fall out unexpectedly. But it was, of course, Twinkle Toes McFinger Bang taking on our 
friend from the land of the rising sun, Mr. Take a Shit, with his manager, Don Fallis. So, why does Kenny Olivier still get the pompous heel ring introduction when he's a babyface? Where Smiley Roberts has to give the over the top description of all of his accolades and things that he's done and blah, blah, blah. And you know, he's a babyface now. The other guy has turned on him. The other guy was their friend. You know how big that is for these guys? Was their friend and turned and joined Don's evil group. So if Twinkle Toes is coming out as the babyface, why is he still being announced like he's a pompous, arrogant, obnoxious heel? It has nothing to do with babyface or heel. It's just all about that inside joke. Okay, well, it's good we got that cleared up. As I said, this wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. They wrestled at the start. And Take a Shit gave Kenny a belly to back and almost dropped him on his head. I don't know whether that was a botch or supposed to be that way. And they, they did go to the floor, but they waited the four whole minutes before they fought on the floor. And then, of course, Twinkle Toes just took over out of nowhere and started doing moonsaults off the railing or whatever. But And then he got the Indian death lock, and they reenacted his one of his favorite scenes from Sissy Boy Slap Fight. Look that up on the internet, people, if you think I'm messing with you. Tyson Smith is in the cast listing. Sissy Boy Slap Fight. Anyway. I, I wrote that Take a Shit needs uh, to follow through on his arm whips. He's getting a little Vader-like with those. But he looks like a star. I like this guy, and he's very athletic. And, you know, this was a modern-style match where he gave Kenny a brain buster on the floor that looked great and then turned around instead of trying to roll him in the ring to beat him, he started pulling chairs out from under the ring and went to use one, drew it back over his head so the referee could take it away. But while the referee was dealing with take a shit and the chair that he'd pulled away from him, Don on the outside takes four chairs, four of them, and stacks them on Kenny's stomach, and Kenny doesn't move them off. So that Tate can do a senton onto the chairs on Kenny on his stomach. And then they got heat on Kenny. Everything that Kenny does annoys me. Whether it's his odd movements or his weird faces or whatever it is, everything that he does, every move he makes, I just don't like this human being. But finally, he did a dive and gesticulated his way through a comeback and hit a couple of his begonia suplexes, I'm sorry, the marigold suplexes, or the snapdragon suplexes. That's it. And it started dragging for me, and I know the people were liking it, but they will not go home. They have to do, as you said, false finish after false finish. And then, this was not a street fight, right? This was not Falls Count Anywhere, not a street fight, not Texas Death. It wasn't no DQ. So Don leaves the screwdriver where Take can find it, and as Kenny picks him up like he's going to give him the one-winged fairy, take a shit, draws the screwdriver back like he's going to stab Kenny in the head. And the referee grabs the screwdriver and takes it away from him. Isn't that, when you see someone attempting to stab someone, isn't that a disqualification? It should be, and I'm not a fan of any of the screwdriver stuff. And then they did more false finishes. And the fans were into them, but there was more of them. And then take a shit, hit a knee lift with his pad down, the little V-trigger thing that Kenny does that's the shittiest. Where's Mr. Wrestling 2 when you need him? That was a fucking knee lift. This, the, this, oh, come the guy, on. That's, that's right. Oh, come on. Omega, guy, Omega's knees look good. The guy can take no bump. He's already on his knees. He he smashes him into the ropes with him. I, if I'm going to see somebody hit a knee lift, I want to see the guy raised up in the air and fucking whoosh, or like Bobby Eaton used to take the bump for wrestling too, spinning around in a fucking circle. 
or something. That was Bobby Eaton. Wrestling 2's knee lift looked like shit by that point. <laughs> That's I like that. Honest. Okay, then Bobby Eaton taking a knee lift from anybody. That's what I want to see. Not this fucking... Bleh. And as I wrote, as usual, they do a thousand false finishes and it ends on the simplest move done, the least impressive strike, the least impressive bump. 25 fucking minutes. For a Kenny match, it wasn't bad. I love take a shit and that's why I I tolerated it because I see something in him. But I didn't think this was as good as the strap match. I'm sorry. I thought it was a good match. Best match of the show uh, to me. Hate the screwdriver stuff. It's unnecessary. It's unneeded. Plus, everyone has a screwdriver. We know that the handles aren't that gigantic. So it's <laughs> silly. And um, beyond that, I think Takeshita, you know, I watched this match for him, not Omega. Not that I have a problem with Omega against him, but it was really, I want to see him in this spot as a big singles match on the show. He continues to impress. And when you see that footage of him just a few years ago, let alone when he first started, but just a couple of years ago, he's still filling out, it seems like. Yeah, he's getting bigger, and he's going to mature, and I, I think they, he's got a lot of upside. And the next match had upside and downside. It was a quattros match. Not the trios, but the quattros. The Guns and Gin and Juice, Bullet Club Gold against the Buckaroos and FTR. And again, they're, they're trying to create some story between the Buckaroos and FTR. Will they get along? Well, they kind of did, but maybe they won't next time. This was the wrong place for it. You've got heels that are charismatic here in the Guns and Gin and Juice. People especially, I think, like Juice. Um, and then the people love FTR, but this was the, the two people on the roster besides Tony Khan himself, the two people on the roster that the fans decided were the reason why they weren't seeing CM Punk was the fucking Cucamonga kids, rightfully so. And so FTR got big cheers and the, the buckaroos got booed out of the building not only on their entrance, but when they would get in the ring, it didn't matter what was going on. The people, until they pretty much got fucking smart to it and quit getting in the ring by themselves, there was always somebody else. But whenever the Bucks were in the ring, just steady booze, loud, booze, just fuck you. And, and I don't blame them, I, honestly, besides the whole punk thing. Half of this match could have been a rematch of the best tag team match ever held. And they put four more guys in to get it, to get in the way of that. And the guns work their ass off. So they fit too, but the buckaroos didn't fit visually, athletically, and the people didn't want to fucking see them. And them standing next to FTR looks like hey, bring your kids to work day. The people have seen through them now, and but they had to have their referee. The corpse referee was involved in this because they have to have this guy because he lets them do whatever they want. They were controlled as, as much as they could be because FTR and either the Guns or Gin and Juice, they'd do great wrestling and great spots, and there would be something good going on. And then the buckaroos got in to do the sloppy gymnastics and the crowd booed them like they were Dominic Mysterio. And then it would continue like that, back and forth. And they tried at some points to do the deal where the partners switch, where Maddie would help Dax with the big rig or Cash would help one of the buckaroos with something or whatever. But, eh... The fans booed little Nikki's comeback. And the whole comeback was the Buckaroos' ridiculous choreographed tumbling, concluding with Nick doing his backflip off the apron that he's done in every match he's had since 2006 and went straight over the top of Juice Robinson, missed every goddamn bit of him. So I liked a lot of this, 
But then it it degenerated at the end with the Bucks involved again to what usually happens with their matches. It didn't make sense. There was a big eight-way schmoz going on. And then suddenly you looked around and there was Dax and Jay alone in the ring trading chops. And then finally, out of nowhere, Jay hit his finish on Cash and Colton pinned him one, two, three. So FTR do another job. But it was good action whenever the Lollipop Guild wasn't involved, but I, you couldn't get a flow going. That's what I saw. What'd you see? This was not good to me. It was not a match you want to see from FTR. I hate the shit, and this is a Bucks thing. Although I'm sure FTR were happy to go along with it. Everyone does the same move at the same time. Guys who don't traditionally do the other guy's finishers all of a sudden are just ready to do it. Guys who don't team up with each other are ready to do the moves together. Yeah. I hate it. It's so, <laughs> it's just lame. And, you know, Omega got a big reaction and he's treated like a big star. How did he not get any of this on him with that crowd, even in Chicago? That's what I'm saying. You know, we've talked about the Bucks don't mean today what they used to mean. I always say when they're attached to Omega, they're safe. There was a reason why it was like, we'll only go to the WWE if we all sign together. Yeah, there's a, re <laughs> there's a reason for that. But when they're on their own, we've all seen everything they do. The cocky little slappable faces that they make just makes you want to go for them, doesn't it? It would work if they used that to be effective heels, which yeah. they didn't. And now they're ineffective baby faces because they're teaming up with the baby face tag team against the heels. And they don't come across well as baby faces. They've had horrible character development, obviously based on their crappy YouTube show. They have very poor standards or sensibilities when it comes to entertainment or comedy or just trying to do any acting. So no, it shouldn't be any surprise. Omega doesn't get it on him. Even Adam Page gets less of it on him than the Bucks. And also people know, I think the general AEW fan wants to close their eyes and think Adam Page really would get a beer with him. Kenny Omega really would sit down and play some video games with him. I think even they know, yeah, the Young Bucks are kind of fucking dicks. <laughs> well, I thought, okay, at least we got one good match on this pay-per-view. Decent main event, eight-man, whatever. And then I was suddenly informed that wasn't the whole show. And I'm thinking, what the fuck? Wait, that's not the main event. The main event was Pockets and the Plumber. <clears throat> Again, I say this, and this drove it home. These people paid for tickets to an AEW pay-per-view at the United Center in Chicago. And we know they thought they were going to see CM Punk. We know they thought they were going to see MJF involved in some kind of big-time match. We know they probably had expectations of seeing some of their favorites in AEW. But do you think when anybody bought any of these tickets, sight unseen to a pay-per-view, they thought that they were going to see a main event of Pockets versus Plumber Moxley? I think not. And by the way, guess what happened? I, I'm not shitting you on this, Brian. This is not hyperbole and exaggeration for comedic effect. As soon as they popped up the graphic that said Pockets versus Plumber for the A&P title or whatever, my DVR froze, not because it was out of time, it froze up and went to a black screen and then the clock disappeared off the front of it and it said boot. It was for whatever reason, it automatically went into reboot mode and it took 10 minutes to go through the rebooting process so that I could go back to the pro. It was trying to tell me for my own good, Jim, you don't want to see this. And it was right. A balding plumber challenged the company mascot for a meaningless title belt in the main event of the second pay-per-view that they have done in seven days, eight days. And they expected people 
to pay for this or in whatever method they bought this, purchased this, or streamed this, and accept that. Talk about Seth Franklin Rollins and Shaky Nakamura not being a pay-per-view main event. What the... F is Tony's not only lost his balls that he possibly never had, he's lost his mind. It, that this was on the card is bad enough. But if you'd put it in the middle, okay, right? But the main event... Will anybody in Chicago ever forgive him that had money invested in this? Sure. Wrestling fans are fickle. They'll be back. <sighs> well, again, they didn't get Punk versus MJF or Punk at all or any. They get this. And I know some people are going to say, well, he's been more serious lately. He's actually doing the wrestling moves. If a chimpanzee can do the wrestling moves, doesn't that just devalue the business as a whole rather than make the chimpanzee a star? Moxley won it, and it took him 20 fucking minutes. But he didn't bleed. Pockets did. And they kicked out of everything. Of course they did. I mean, I didn't watch it because I'm not going to dignify this foolishness with my time, but that's what garbage wrestlers do is they fantasize that they're real athletes and they go about imitating the moves that they have seen money-drawing talent do and they kick out of all of them to show how tough they are and then somebody finally figures, okay, we've done everything we know how to do, let's just Stop. But that's all it is with Orange Cassidy when people are like, oh, he's a great worker because he has this gimmick which is ridiculous and we're supposed to just accept it and let it play into everything. Why is he a great worker? Because he could do some of the moves and because he kicks out of everything? I feel like that's all it takes for certain people. If you could take a big move and kick out a two and a half and get them to go, oh, and then do that again within 30 seconds and then repeat that within 15 to 20 seconds later, add another one, about 45 seconds later, keep repeating this, maybe let the other guy get a few in there. That's all it takes. It's that simple for a lot of people. It's just not that simple for me. Moxley's the worst wrestler in the business. It's amazing when you hear things like Danielson say, Moxley's the best wrestler in the business. It's the exact opposite. I'm telling you, Danielson is either too nice or he's had too many concussions or possibly a mixture of the two because he's involved in a bunch of shit that a guy with his talent could easily say no to and shouldn't be anywhere near. And the plumber is one of them. They fit like oil and fucking crankcase solution. Before we uh, wrap this up, just one quick note. I did watch some of the- Are we almost there? Yeah. Well, that was the main event, right? This is Holy it? Holy No, it wasn't the main event. It was the last match. Go ahead. Um, Tony Khan, Tony Khan, Tony Khan at the media scrum said they estimate that according to preliminary reports, the pay-per-view did it in the area of a hundred thousand buys. They think all in last week did 200,000 buys and he plans on this being a recurring annual thing all in and then Labor Day weekend right back to all out in Chicago. What are your thoughts about that here? Could, on pay-per-view a week apart. We assume it'll be on pay-per-view next year. You never know where their streaming rights will end up or the premium live event rights. Oh, well, he this was such a rousing success for him. He sold more tickets than any show has ever sold and as a result fired his biggest star and came back and killed the biggest market in the United States for fucking AEW wrestling in the course of a weekend. And... He did 200,000 buys for the pay-per-view in Wembley, if, if that's a fact. Well, I figured they would because their normal is 150 or 160, and this was the biggest show of all time, and everybody was curious about it. And then he comes and does a half of that a week later. He ought to be goddamn turning cartwheels if he could get 100,000 people to buy this thing when nobody knew what was going to fucking happen. But, goddamn... Do you think anybody's going to buy it next time when they not only know, don't know any of the matches, but they know that last time they put on a show where you didn't know any of the matches, it fucking stunk? 
Well, that's the disconnect right there. There are fans who loved it. There are fans who, and I'm not joking, and I'm not even saying this to get you fired up, they believe this is one of the greatest pay-per-views of all time, that the match quality is off the scale, everything was great. Those fans see it that way. I see it as kind of an average pay-per-view at best with a couple of good moments or matches. But there are other people who think it's like one of the all-time great, the strap match in combination with the Moxley match, with the Omega match, the Bucks and FTR match. It's one of the greatest shows of all time. Where were all these easily pleased people when we had to sell them tickets every fucking week? It would have made our job so much easier. They weren't even in the womb yet. That's the issue. All righty. Well... Do you have room in your womb for more wrestling? We can talk about it on the next program. You're hosting. I, I if, if it, no. Uh, <laughs> I would love to talk about wrestling, just not any of this stuff. <laughs>